I, I often wish in English we had a word that combined three ideas, improving, getting better, changing, and learning. Because whatever that word would be, that's the word we're looking for. This is High Tech High Unboxed. I'm Alec Patton. And I'm here today with Stacey Callier, the director of the Center for Research on Equity and Innovation at the High Tech High Graduate School of Education. Yes. And Stacy, you brought us our interview today. Tell us about who you, who you talk to and why you want to talk to them. So I have been a big Don Berwick fan for years, pretty much ever since I learned about improvement. And earlier this year, I was at a virtual convening and I was put into a breakout room. And when I entered the breakout room, the first face that I saw on the video screen was Don Berwick's. And I knew it was him because I literally had a screenshot of his image on my desktop because I had recently used it for a slide I was presenting for a grad class. And I saw him and I was like, what? Don Berwick is in this breakout room with me? And I ended up private chatting him during the session, basically just to say how much of a fan I was of his work and the impact he's had on healthcare. And he, being the beautiful person that he is, wrote right back to me and was like, oh, I'd love to chat more and hear about High Tech High and what you guys are all doing. And so excited this is taking root in education. And so I asked him, great. I would love to talk with you. And he gave me his email and then it went from there. We set up a conversation with him and our team and got to ask him all of these great questions, just spent an hour like learning from him. And at the end of it, I just thought, I wish I would have recorded that entire conversation. And all of us were talking about it for weeks afterwards. Thus the podcast. You got to take another shot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And people outside the continuous improvement fan community may wonder why you were so excited, but your introduction to Don, I think very, very briefly encapsulates uh, how impressive his resume is. So let's just play it. You were a career pediatrician who then went on to be president of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. You launched the 100,000 Lives campaign. You became part of the Obama administration. You ran for governor of Massachusetts. If you don't mind, can we just start at the beginning with when you know you wanted to be a doctor? Oh, from the moment of birth. I mean, I grew up in a really small town in Connecticut, a very rural town. My father was the only doctor there for many, many years, general practitioner made house calls. He rounded at the hospital every day. He was an old style GP. And so, I don't know, my image was always of that lifestyle and, and that commitment to community. And of course, he was pretty honored in the community. You know, he was, everyone respected him. And so I guess that must have attracted me. So I, I always intended to be a doctor. My mother was a pretty active member of the community and kind of, you know, a school committee and other um, public services. And that, so that kind of informed the other side of my intentions, but I don't ever remember not wanting to be a doctor. So what brought you to improvement and why did you become such a champion for it in healthcare? When I was in medical school, I got a joint degree in public policy that happened to be Harvard Medical School, had this opportunity and it was very attractive to me. So I kind of entered medical career with a lot of background ammunition on statistics and operations research, political science, economics. I was, I was sort of interested in organizations. And that led me when I finally began my career after training to be drawn into the Harvard Community Health Plan, which was a health maintenance organization. I was in charge of research there, but also told to take a look at quality of care, which I did for several years. And it was boring. It was stable, like nothing was ever changing. We certainly had evidence of lots of problems, but nothing ever changed. The only thing that changed was that people got angrier and angrier because we got lots of measurements and we told them that the waiting times were too long or that the complication rates were too high. And they'd say, yeah, we know it. We're trying as hard as we can. It was pretty bleak. And that led me to a sort of accidental journey of encouraged by the chief executive of that HMO to go look at other industries. And that was, that sort of began stuff for me. I was, quality issues had been a sideline for me, but once I started seeing what was happening at NASA or Bell Laboratories or globally competitive manufacturing companies or um, hotel chains, there was a very, very systematic approach to improvement and healthcare hadn't learned it. And so with a number of friends, we had a group of seven or eight people that were kind of doing the same thing together and the support of the John A. Hartford Foundation, we founded first a demonstration project to see if modern approaches to improving systems could work in healthcare. 
And then eventually when, when the answer was yes, for sure, the foundation agreed to anchor the founding of a nonprofit, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, IHI, which I then ended up running for 19 years before I went into the Obama administration. That's the short story. There's a lot of details in there. Uh, that's so great. One of the things that I've been really in, intrigued by in the talks that you've given is I think in education, people often talk like there's this tension between improvement and innovation, as if you're either in one camp or the other. And I don't sense that same tension in healthcare. And I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about how do you see the relationship between improvement and innovation? First, there is that tension in healthcare. I often hear that debate. It's sort of a silly debate, if you ask me. So improving is doing better for whatever your mission is, doing better for the people you serve. And it's always about learning. It's about doing something new. It could be something small that's new, like discovering that in the sequence of work that you have to, in healthcare, take an electrocardiogram from a patient, or maybe in, in education, it would be the sequence of work you do to assure that adequate supplies are in the classroom. Maybe you find steps that aren't needed. So why don't we do that? We keep a record, but nobody uses it. Or we, we buy this, but nobody uses it. So that's little micro improvement. And it's a change. You, you, know, you take that step out of process. There are bigger changes like learning that the way you approach a kid struggling with uh, algebra is different from the way I do it and you get better results. So I'd like to learn how you do it, Stacey. What, what's your way of doing that? That's a little bigger. Maybe we have different classrooms and they're really, really different. And I can learn how to reconfigure architectural space. So improvement is like this nested idea. And maybe at some point the change gets bold enough or big enough or unfamiliar enough that we would call it innovation. But to me, it's a continuum. It's all about learning and trying new things in a way that is informative. So I don't, I don't, I don't see that boundary. I mean, obviously we can get hooked on our current processes and say, well, you could never teach over the internet. And then when someone says, oh, yes, you can, and it's a big surprise, we call that an innovation. But no, it's, um, it's all part of a continuum to me. The heart of it is learning, learning a new, a new system. I like that a lot. One of the things that we've talked about was the importance of co-design. Could you talk about how co-design emerged for you is so important? I, I often wish in English we had a word that combined three ideas, improving, getting better, changing and learning because whatever that word would be that's the word we're looking for you want doing better learning and changing those, those are the nexus so in the search for change and for learning how to do something new the question is what's the position of the person we're trying to help in my case a patient in the case of the classroom i suppose not only but including the kid it turns out to a level i never ever understood at first when you get the, the beneficiary, the person you're trying to help in the room, like all the time, and always reinvent together, it's a much, much more effective way to change so that the resultant product or service is co-designed. It's actually, we've done it together. It, it, that's important in product design because when you're making a car or a pencil, you know, you, the person using it can really contribute an awful lot. And by the way, can save you a lot of money because usually you're doing stuff that doesn't help them at all. And they say, why do you bother with that? I don't care about that. In services like healthcare or education, it's much more important. Services, they're going to be co-produced. You know, a teacher doesn't produce education and a child consume it. The teacher and the child together are producing learning. So you're always doing that, whether you like it or not. Co-designing means you'd figure out how to do that better together all the time. It's a shift of power, actually, in healthcare it is anyway, where when properly done, patients and families and communities, they feel much more powerful in helping determine the processes that are helping them stay or get, stay healthy or get healthy. I'm intrigued at what could happen in a classroom. I have, an 11, I have eight grandchildren, but my eldest is an 11-year-old boy, and he's pretty smart. He's pretty observant. And I would imagine a teacher would be really smart to say to Nathaniel, how's it going? Am I doing okay? What would you like to be different about the way we're approaching this and working together? That's co-production or co-design. Can you say a little bit more about like what that looks like in healthcare? I can start with a, with a little story that I tell. So when I have four kids of my own and, and four kids, and when the second one, my wife was pregnant with my second second child. I remember one time we went into the obstetrician's office together. Paul Goldstein was his name. And he examined my wife and, you know, did what he had to do to kind of assure everything was okay. Then he said, I know you're very busy, but would the two of you just spend another couple of minutes with me? He said, sure. He said, today in my office, in what happened and the way you were greeted and the way I 
I examined you in and the, in the way the, the whole thing, was there anything that could have been better? And we said, no, no, it was fine. He said, no, no, no. Tell me something that could have been better. That's all it is. It's this micro interaction of how's this going? Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center has brought it to full scale. So um, patients and families are on the board. They're in every improvement meeting. They're in, in the design work of the organization. They just, they really don't take many steps without patients, kids, and families in the room doing it together because they know they get better results. The designs are going to be smarter. The waste will be lower and the, the work more targeted at needs. In the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, IHI, thanks to my successor CEO, Maureen Bizignano, and two other researchers, Michael Barry and Susan Edgman-Levitan, there's a, a particular form this takes. Maureen teaches it as what matters to you, medicine. And the concept is in healthcare, you know, we say to the patient, what's the matter with you? And then I'll fi fix you up. The idea is change the question, not what's the matter with you, but what matters to you. Just start there. And that redirects the work in a profound way. There's now an international What Matters to You Day every year. Millions, millions of healthcare workers are encouraged to ask that question and use, I, I don't mean once, I mean all the time. I don't know how that would work in a classroom. I guess, you, I guess you could say to a kid, you know, what matters to you today? And think about learning as moving toward that need. I mean, you would bring stuff right home. So this, I think my two oldest children are boys, Ben and Dan, and oh, maybe they were probably, probably 10 and eight or 11 and nine. We were driving in the car and I don't know, I guess I was studying improvement or something. And I, I said to them, hey, Ben and Dan, you know, uh, I'd like to be a better parent. What would be some ideas about how to be a better parent? And they took me seriously and they, had, they kind of had a little meeting in the backseat of the car. And then they said, okay, dad, you know, here's something. Um, when, we, when we ever ask you for money, you get angry. And they said, you could change that. You could say, no, that's fine. I mean, we understand we won't always get what we ask for, but you don't have to get angry. And what they were tuning into was my own background. I think I mentioned to you, my father was a, grew up in the Great Depression. Money was very charged, but they were co-designing parenting with me. And, you know, they were, they were just right. You know, I, I, that was just waste and I could change it. And then the most profound thing is what happened in about a minute later, as we were driving along after that transaction, they were chatting and then they said, we have a question, which is how could we be better children? I mean, it was just this beautiful dynamic of let's help each other. And I think that's, that's what we're after. And you can after at every level, right? From that little individual transaction all the way up to, to what a school is, for example, or what a hospital is. And what did you say to your children? I don't remember. Uh, they were they were so great. <laughs> I must have told them something, but I don't know, probably about making their beds or something. But it was it was uh, it was the dynamic that I noticed. Yeah, yeah. I remember you told a story during our last conversation too about a hospital team that was meeting and they had come up with some idea or something, and there was a patient who was in the room that finally. Oh yeah, yeah. Do you mind retelling that story? Yeah, this is, a, this is a very powerful story, and it really has a point to it. So um, one of the severe chronic illnesses in kids is cystic fibrosis, uh, you know, genetic disease. And I mean, when I was began my training, kids died. They never got to teenage years or rarely did. But, you know, luckily, there are cystic fibrosis centers all over the country, 160 of them at the time of this story. And they've been working away with research for years and years and years. And they've done a lot. And now it's not at all uncommon for people with CF to live into adulthood or even late adulthood. It's been real progress. And it's all done with a database that the 160 centers have contributed to through the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. They pour data into this database and then they can do research with the data. However, it's a secret database. That is, if you have a child that has CF, I presume you might want to go there and say, um, okay, I could go to any CF center in, in this area who's the best, who, who's got the longest survival, who, who preserves lung function the best, where are the kids gaining weight the most? The foundation knows, but they wouldn't tell you. It was a research database. This had been controversial for a long time, and consumer rights advocates had been saying, oh, no, no, you have to release the data. And they'd say, well, if we release the data, no one will give us the data because, you know, they'll use it for competitive advantage. You know, Stacy's hospital will be afraid that Don's hospital's better and they'll lose patients. So it was, it was not shared. But they were worried about this. And one day they called, a, one time they called a board meeting and asked me to come because they knew I worked on improvement. And in the room, they had the mother of a CF patient. And we were talking in the room. And I knew on her page from my work with Cincinnati Children's 
so the, the board of the foundation was saying, you know, should we, should we make these data public or not? And I remember turning to Mrs. Page and I said, well, Mrs. Page, what would you advise? And she said, I would advise you that for my daughter, the clock is ticking. And you could just almost hear the shift. How could they not share this information? Uh, and they faced it, they came up with it. And, and that's a happy story in its own, but the happier part of it is that from then on, they continued, of course, to track cystic fibrosis outcomes in the 160 centers. The slope of improvement doubled that year and kept going at that new rate. Just sharing the information allowed them to enter a whole new phase of learning and exchange. So now they could find out that, you know, the such and such center in wherever Minnesota was having the best lung function preservation. And everyone could then say, hey, how do you do that? And the worst one could say, uh, excuse me, we've got a problem. Can someone come over here and help us? Uh, it changes the dynamic. I'm so glad you brought that up. I think we're seeing that in education right now, too. There's so much fear around, like, no, we can't actually highlight who's doing great work or who's really struggling because then they, they'll be afraid. Yeah. Well, if the education system is managed or incented with winners and losers, so there's the good schools, the bad ones, and the good ones get praised and the bad ones get blamed. I mean, that's not a learning dynamic. You know that with kids. I don't imagine you're a very successful teacher. You set up a classroom in which every kid wants to beat every other kid in which someone's gain is someone else's loss. That's fear. That's not learning. I mean, we, in IHI, one of our, we have many slogans. One of them is all teach, all learn. You know, you may think that hospital is kind of not doing too well, but I'll tell you, they know something other hospitals need to know. And it doesn't matter where they are in that league table. Uh, same is true in, in human development. Everybody can help. Well, kind of staying with that, what does that culture look and feel like? like what are the characteristics of it? I don't want to be glib about it, but I might ask a teacher that, like, say, like, okay, if you have a classroom or a kid and you want to create an ideal environment for that, those kids in that classroom to learn or the kid to learn, what, what would be some of the words that would occur to you? I'll guarantee almost everything you think of applies to improvement in an organizational level. So you have to begin with the absence of fear. Fear and improvement are not compatible. Fear and learning are not compatible. And I, as a father of four and a grandfather of eight, I know that when a kid's scared, they're too busy being scared to learn. And the same is true in organizations. So there's this enormous weight on the shoulders of leaders to create an environment in which people are not afraid of each other. And that is subtle because the minute you sit as a leader in judgment or in uh, the minute you're the distributor of rewards and punishments as a leader, you lost the game. You lost at the start because you're creating an atmosphere in which people are scared of you, of change, of failure, of each other. And that's not compatible with improvement. There has to be a set of other supports as well. For example, learning takes uh, some time. You don't get it kind of for free. It's like a front-end investment. So creating uh, processes in, in a workplace where there's time to reflect, stop, pause, everybody stop. How are we doing? What did you just learn? We tried this. Did anyone notice anything? That reflective moment we call the PDSA cycle, plan, do, study, act, but that's just jargon. It just means reflect, act and reflect. What I notice in very busy healthcare systems is there's no time for reflection. Nobody has the time to stop and say, what just happened? How are we doing? In a workplace that can improve, that's embedded in the workflow. You have in the workflow, the very processes of reflection. Another related to the fear issue is, is uh, the encouragement to take risks. Again, I'm, I'm I always use child metaphors, but like uh, kids learn to ride a bicycle. That's an improvement. They never learn to ride a bicycle without falling. You try and then you fall and then you learn. And so in some environments treat a failure as a bad thing, as opposed to a lesson. I do think back to the discussion of co-design, I think an environment which invites, I'll say the customer in the room, the, the, in your case, it's a student um, in the family, is going to learn faster because they're going to have a much more intimate and immediate uh, sensing capacity so they could they can really assess the assess what they do then there's another infrastructure is measurement this is a very edgy one because in an environment of fear and surveillance measurement is the tool of abuse in an environment of learning measurement is the tool of growth Unfortunately, if the psychology is wrong, the measurement gets tainted by the psychology of um, punishment or reward. And so uh, 
the part of the attributes of a learning system is that uh, measurement assessment occurs, but it's always in the service of answering questions people have. Uh, so the measurement's the servant, not not the master. One thing I'll say about that also, just as I watch education get interested in metrics, measurement doesn't always mean numbers. Reflection is measurement. Uh, stories are measurement. When that obstetrician asked my wife and me, could anything have gone better? He, he was measuring, but he was doing it narratively. That's perfectly fine. That's one of the one of the tools we have. But sometimes numbers help. And if numbers are going to help, you have to kind of have to know how to interpret them. So there's a little bit of statistical side to this. I love that. I remember you mentioning on our last call that you felt like narrative measurement was vastly undervalued. Instead of the word measurement, we should learn a word like growing knowledge or, or uh, a useful reflection. And of course, in, in our lives, we do that all the time. How did the soup taste? You know, how did that conversation go? How was that movie? Sometimes we go to numbers. How much gas is left in the tank? You know, what's the temperature outside? But we don't always go to numbers. And yet we still learn all the time through other methods of hearing, which are crucial. I want to go back to this idea of PDSAs and just how it really is just act and reflect, because I think that's definitely something we see in education, too, that teachers just feel so busy. There's no time to actually reflect on what you're learning. You're just doing, doing, doing. And I'm curious if you could share anything about, like, how do you build in those moments to be reflective? And is there kind of like things leaders can do to support yeah. in that? First of all, tr try to take the mystery away. So PDSA, Plan to Study Act, that is just a very, it's a very helpful mnemonic to remind you to try something. But don't just try it. Try it under conditions when you'll learn from the trial. So I, you know, I was think I mentioned the pea soup. So when we were making, pea, my wife and I are having pea soup tonight, we're going to take a spoon. We think curry might make it a little better. There's some curry in it, but maybe not enough. We made it, this is pea soup we, we made and, and put in the freezer. So I know what's going to happen tonight, which is my wife, who's pretty sure about the curry, is going to say, taste this. We'll taste it while it's on the stove heating. And then she'll say, enough curry? I don't know. Let's add a little more. We'll put a little more in there. We'll taste it again. PDSA, plan, <laughs> do, study, and then act. Um, that's, we just need to keep doing that. So you taste the the issue of energy that you're talking about is important, but I would say even a teacher, even a busy teacher can try stuff. You know, I think the, the leader could possibly arrange for contexts in a teacher's life where he or she could, could get an idea to, to test, like the idea to use curry. To do that, you need to be able to sit together with friends with a particular question, is, who's trying something I haven't tried? Or I have this problem. Has anyone met this problem before? What do you do about it? And you can do that socially with the classroom next door. You can do it in hopefully a teacher's meeting. You can do it in a development day. You can do it in the pre-COVID era with an airplane ticket or a train ride or now with a Zoom. I mean, Zoom should make it easy for 15 schools to get together and decide what are they doing about learning loss and is there something they should try differently. And then PDSA is just putting it, it's like getting on the bike. You, you go back to the real world, hopefully with some friends, you, you say, oh, Tuesday at 11, we're going to try this. You try it Tuesday at 11. And then at noon, you say, okay, everybody, how did that go? What just happened? Plan, do, study, act. That's all there is to it. Uh, 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 at more complex environments, you may need more complex metrics. You may need to actually measure something and put it on a run chart and graph some dots. And then use, you might even want to use some statistical techniques to see if the variation you're seeing is random or not. And, and they're great techniques for that. And in a one hour course, you can learn them. But that there, there should be no mystery about it. That's, it's not mysterious. We started calling, calling them um, try, collect, reflect cycles. Because like for yeah. some reason, PDSA was just tripping people up often. But, but when we like, just try something, collect some data and reflect. That's all it is. You know, one more step. I think you need to keep the A, the PDSA, because if, once you reflect, uh -huh. you got to make it a cycle. You got to put it back into the loop and say, you act. You can keep it mm -hmm. if it's the right amount of curry. You can change the change, which is add different curry, or you can ad abandon it, which is turns out curry doesn't work at all. So, you, but that step after reflection, that's the momentum uh, to get to the next test. Right. Right. One of the other things that you talked about too, kind of getting at this 
thing of like, let's just try something kind of having a culture. You also talked about joy and I would love to have you just talk about where does joy fit in with improvement? Because I totally think it fits in an improvement. It has to be there, but I don't know that people always go there automatically. It's just true that in a service industry, especially like healthcare or education, the customer, the student, the family, the, the patient won't be treated better than the workforce feels. If the workforce is happy and buoyant and energetic, then that's what the student or family or patient is going to feel. There's energy here. W. Edwards Deming, the great scholar, talked about pride in work. He said it's all about pride in work. So that when people feel good about their work, virtuous cycles begin. And so I you know, push it as hard as I feel, which is we, we need to have joy in work. It is, a, it is not a kind of icing on any cake. It's the cake. So exploring what it is that creates joy and meaning and pride, that's part of uh, leadership. And if you, if you don't attend to it, you're going to get in a bad relationship with your workers and your staff as a leader. You'll be then in transactional mode instead of relationship mode. The good news is, in, especially in service professions like healthcare and education, people, want, of course, they want to be proud. You want, you want to be proud that you can help a kid thrive? My goodness. Of course you do. So rediscovering that and connecting the meaning back to the work is crucial. Part of it is, is infrastructure. You then have to have conditions of work, which are respectful. You have to have respect. Paul O'Neill, who was the longtime CEO of Alcoa Aluminum, and then he, he became treasury secretary. Uh, Paul was one of the great students and teachers of improvement really in the world. His focus was largely on safety worker safety, which is why Alcoa became the safest heavy industry in the world to work for. Paul used to say that uh, although he, he, he was a, very much a student and teacher of improvement, like you and I have been talking about, Stacy, he said it's precondition for excellence. He didn't say it condition. He said precondition, which is that every single person in the organization can say every day, I was treated with respect and dignity by everyone I encountered. I was given the tools and support to do the work that gives meaning to my life, adds meaning to my life. And the third was someone notices. He said, those are preconditions for excellence. It didn't quite go as far as joy, but if you think about meaning and work, that's joy. And uh, it's, it's absolutely essential. And I would think in our, in our two industries, uh, education and healthcare, it ought to be right at hand. We're doing good stuff. I have to shift so that you can see the thing behind me that says, be the be one. The one notices. I love that. Yeah. O'Neill's, uh, O'Neill's triad I use all the time. Uh, I get treated with respect and dignity by everyone I encounter. I have the tools and supports to do the work that adds meaning in my life and someone notices. And uh, I love that. Again, wait, that, wouldn't that be true of raising a happy child or uh, <laughs> having definitely. a happy classroom? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So kind of, Building off of that, one of the things I was really struck by in our conversation last time, too, is that you talked about the role that a leader needs to play to be able to support that kind of culture and how you described leaders who help build a culture where improvement and learning can flourish is that they have this authentic curiosity and also humility. Can you say a little bit more about like it's related to the comments on fear and on learning that I made earlier, which is um, I think the leaders that are at best at nurturing the environments for learning themselves are learners. That's who they are. That's what they do. And so that means that there's a certain level of humility and a high level of humility and empathy and relationship building and curiosity. I don't think a good leader shows up with answers much. You're just not smarter than the people you're leading. You have a more, get paid more maybe, and you have a degree after your name, but you're not likely to be that much smarter. We're all smarter together than separately. And so a leader who knows that and who's curious, you know, like what, what, what could I learn today? What do I not know that I could know? That's a very important asset in improvement. It also signals the workforce that that's a good question for them too. Uh, there's also, frankly, a level of nurturance in this too. It's, it's, um, you kind of really have to care about the mission and about the people. I mean, you got to, inauthenticity will be detected fast by the workforce. They'll, they'll know a show from the real thing. So at our last team meeting, and this wasn't even primed by me, this was somebody else who's a fan. 
we actually watched the clip of a talk that you gave in 2008, I think, for IHI, where you were essentially your confessions of an extremist. Oh, yeah. And just talking about where you were kind of arguing for this radical transfer of power and like a bolder meaning for patient centered care and shared your own fears of becoming a patient and why. And we were all really struck that you ended with this statement of if we be healers, then. And it wasn't like if we be doctors or teachers or whatever, but if we be healers. And that idea of being a healer feels so important right now in education too. Could you say a little bit more about what that means to you to be a healer? I mean, to me, the word, the word healing invokes a larger frame than just treating or doctoring. You know, the human condition is complex and people come to us with their needs and their, whatever they be. And, and, and the, you know, I think the job is to help people my job is a, in that role is to help people pursue, I guess, what matters to them. Uh, and healing to me is to give people as much as I can the power to go where they wish. And um, it just is so different from the professionally dominated model where I know you don't follow my directions. We call them doctor's orders, you know. To me, that's the it's less transactional than doctoring. And it's more, it is more holistic, more like the whole person, like within education. I don't know. I mean, uh, does a teacher, a teacher could say my job today is to make sure that this child can solve this algebra equation. That's an achievement or can learn the conceptual underpinnings of problem solving itself. That's another achievement or can become a more connected, confident, and compassionate person, first of all, to themselves. And, and I think to me, yeah, I want kids to learn algebra, but I think that you can do that in a way that leaves them even happier with themselves. I think that's probably the equivalent transition, maybe, I don't know. I love that. You don't, you don't have an algebra student in front of you, you have a whole person. Right. One of the things I have really appreciated about talking with you and reading your work has been that my first introduction to improvement was very technical. And actually, I did not like it at all. <laughs> um, coming from a background in ethnography and as a teacher, I was just like, no, it's not all just about these tools and charts. And I think those tools and charts are really helpful and important. But I think sometimes improvement gets characterized as this technical, highly rational process that can feel like a big turnoff to a lot of folks. And I've been struck by that when you talk about it, you talk about it as like deeply relational. And we've touched on this throughout, but I'm just curious if there's anything you would say about this characterization of a technical rational. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a mix. It's a wonderful, for me, a wonderful mixture of technical and spiritual relational stuff. The, the root sciences of the improvement that I understand are, in fact, engineering sciences. They came out of systems theory, general systems theory, and um, statistics and physics. But soon upon adoption in industries, people like Deming and Durant realized it's, it's not just tools, it's context, it's culture. Together, they're quite powerful. But the tools overgrew, <laughs> you know, the, uh, like partly because of consultancies, you know, they're quality improvement consultants and they make their money by patenting uh, fishbone diagrams or whatever. You no, know, I, I think just take a breath. Maybe for a novice, learning some tools is good. But if I'm right, and I, I may not be right, but I think the whole heart of this is learning, then you keep asking the question, how can we know more? If the tool is there can help you, like it almost always helps to put something on a graph if you're tracking over time. Well, then use them, but they're not the boss. You're the boss. And, and so if, if it helps, use it. And I just don't like it when, uh, you know, it shouldn't, doesn't start with tools. It starts with aim. starts with commitment, heart, you know. And I think, I think yeah, relationships, Stacey. I, I'll show you something. I just gave a speech yesterday, and I was, I was talking about. So this is, this is my favorite text, you know, the Improvement Guide. It's really, really good. It was written by friends of mine, Associates of Practice Improvement. And it's, you know, it goes over both the technique and the culture. But I was, what I was talking about yesterday was uh, Appendix A. What they did here is they searched their own experience for what they call design ideas or change concepts. These are basic good ideas. And if you know the idea and you're doing a redesign, then you might think of using it. I'll tell you one idea. One idea is 
process things in parallel instead of in series. In general, if you're doing stuff in series, it's a little more costly and more prone to problems than if you process in parallel. That's a general idea. Another would be, well, what I said about earlier, remove excess steps, study how many steps you're taking, and then take the ones away that don't seem to help. So these are change concepts. Now, whether you call that technical or cultural, I don't know, but you're really smart to use them. You're really smart to go to Appendix A and the Improvement Guide and say, are there any ideas here we could put to use? That level of technique is like a recipe book. Like we want to learn pea soup. I guess we look at the pea soup recipe and say, how's that one? That's all. But don't get trapped in the tools, Stacey. You're absolutely right. They're just there if you need them. Cool. Thank you. Is there anything we haven't touched on that were kind of lessons from healthcare improvement efforts that you feel like education really needs to learn? The two that, that I would reinforce, one is, you, you said earlier, one is get the kid in the room. Do this with the child, not to the child. And the, the development of better teaching, education, and learning to me as a co-designed thing with my 11-year-old grandson, it'll be better than if you don't include him. That I'm, I'm sure of it. I, that might even be true of my three-year-old granddaughters. I, I, I don't know, uh, but I think you could push it. Certainly for parents, you know, they're, they're living complex lives. Get them in the room, do this together. Don't feel so much smarter than them. And um, you'll have to be very gentle and very welcoming and respectful in order to begin to elicit all the help that we can get from the abundance of supports that the people we're trying to help bring to us to help them. I, th I think the other is take some risks here, like try stuff. If you just keep changing in an informative, reflective way and share what you're learning, I just think the sky's the limit. You got your wonderful industry. I mean, you know, gee, I, I, I guess if I were to start again, maybe I'd, I'd be in education. I, I, I love what I see. It's not too late. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you this, that uh, I, this is not part of what you want to dinner me about, but so I come from healthcare, which is spending 18% of our gross domestic product. We're almost a $4 trillion industry in this country. And we complain in healthcare that we don't get paid enough. And I go to schools and I see what resource constraints your wonderful teachers and principals and workforce, the resource constraints schools are under are shocking to me. And I hope that just politically, there'll be some rebalancing at some point when we begin to understand that investing in the development of a young person isn't just the nicest thing we can do, it's the smartest thing we can do. And I hope that, I'll call it inequity, can get somehow redressed and we can put the resources where they're needed. Meanwhile, it makes it even more important that education learn and use the tools of improvement because in their essence, that what they're really trying to do is make the best of what you have to help the people you want to help. And uh, so it, I think the stakes are pretty high. Anything else you want to say? No, thanks a lot. And I hope this won't be our last conversation. I won't let it be if you won't. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Berwick. Uh, it's my pleasure, Stacey. And it's Don from now on, okay? Okay. <laughs> High Tech High Unboxed is hosted and produced by me, Alec Patton. Our theme music is by Brother Herschel. Huge thanks to Stacey Callier for interviewing Don Berwick and for having the idea for this episode in the first place. You can learn more about Don Berwick and the Institute for Healthcare Improvement on the Institute's website, www.ihi.org. You can find that link, plus a link to the book that Don Berwick mentioned, The Improvement Guide, in our show notes. There's also a link to a full episode transcript. Thanks for listening.